This conference, this conference will now be recorded. All right. So you're, okay. Is it muted or unmuted? Unmuted. All right. Well, we'll get started. Okay. <laughs> I'll primarily talk to you, but I'll look up at the cameras every once in a while. Okay. As well. um, welcome everybody back from your break. My name is Michaela Bishop, and I'm with the Oklahoma Department of Human Services Developmental Disability Services Division. Um, I have worked for, and we call it DDS. I've worked for DDS for, well, next week it'll be 37 years. Um, just to let you know a little bit about me. Um, my background, I have a master's in clinical psychology and so I've worked with positive behavior supports with people in, with intellectual disabilities. I'm currently the training director and the director of psychological services for our division. And uh, what we're gonna talk about today are the services, the community services that exist for people with disabilities. But, but we're also gonna talk about um, the service, a little bit about the service system that exists through the um, ICF IIDs, the Intermediate Care Facilities individuals with intellectual disabilities, um, which is where some of you may end up working or work now. Um, and I am familiar with those. I'm familiar with the Title 19 Medicaid requirements for those facilities. I've done technical assistance. Okay. Those facilities. Wow. Is it because my phone's on? Yep. Sometimes I don't need There we go. There we go. That always adds a little something though to the presentation. I will tell you too, as we start, um, you know, anybody that's got questions, just feel free to, to ask it as we go along. And it's always been, I've done this numerous times and it never goes till for an hour and a half. So, <laughs> so I'm sure you will get out a little early or maybe a lot early, we'll just see. Um, I'm gonna. Uh, what I, I want to start out with was, was some of the history of services, and I'm gonna try to make it interesting and not dry. Sometimes you hear history and you're like, oh great. Especially at the end of the day, everybody, you know, yay. Um, but some of it's really interesting, and, and as we go through this, I'm gonna kind of go in chronological order, and you're and you're gonna see. Um, we're gonna talk about what was happening at the national level on this screen, and then the next one maybe what was happening in Oklahoma at the same time kinds of things, just so you get a little bit of an idea of how we got to where we are today. Um, the first institutions in the United States, as it says, were uh, built in the 1850s. In 1909, I need to get a copy of that. In 1909, the, the legislature um, designated funding for the state's first institution, the Oklahoma Institution for the Feeble-Minded, isn't that a fabulous name, um, opened in, in Enid. And several years later, it was renamed the Enid State School. But yeah, there's been a lot of interesting terminology for people with intellectual disabilities. We'll talk a little bit about that as we go along as well. There's a picture of the <laughs> Institute for the Feeble-Minded in Enid. Nice building, kind of, you know, sort of like a capital or something. Then in 1907, the training school for white boys, and it's actually wayward white boys, was um, created in Paul's Valley, and later that became the Paul's Valley State School. So it didn't even start out as a facility for individuals with disabilities. It started out for bad, bad white boys. And there's a, an original picture of it. None of those buildings are here anymore, I can tell you. I actually used to work at the Falls Valley State School. And uh, so this is really, some really old pictures. Now, some parents, you know, back then, okay, um, when a child was born with an obvious disability of some kind, the doctor's immediate response was, oh, you know, how unfortunate. 
You need to put that child away. Um, let someone care for that child who knows what they're doing and provide the best supports for it. And, you know, sometimes they would say, just don't think about him anymore or whatever. He'll be much better off there. Um, that kind of thing. But some parents chose to keep their children at home. Um, they're like, mm, no, no, you know, we're going to raise him. And so uh, in the early 1950s, there weren't, there weren't, just weren't many services, school or otherwise. But in the 50s, some parents banded together to form their own um, specialized schools and work training centers. And one of the first schools was called the Dale Rogers School, founded in 1953. I don't know how old anybody is out there in the audience, but you may not know who Dale Rogers was. Um, but he used to have, certainly in my day, when I was young, there was a TV cowboy named Roy Rogers and his wife, Dale Evans. They had a TV show, black and white TV show, and, and uh, that they had a child. They had a child with an intellectual disability with Down syndrome, some heart issues, and some other things. And so that got them interested in, uh, in services for, for their child. And so the Dale Rogers, there's still a Dale Rogers program here in Oklahoma City today that does a lot of things. Um, they have work programs, they have some residential programs. They do, um, they have a um, employment program that makes trophies. Um, it's called Prism Place, Prism, not prison. Um, where they do acrylic awards and things like that when companies need them. And here's a picture of an early, um, very early educational uh, a class. I thought it's not, it says 1957. I didn't know if it said the age of the, of the kids, if this was, second grade or something like that. But this is a class for kids with intellectual disabilities back in the late, late 1950s. Then in 1961, President Kennedy created the President's Panel on Mental Retardation. And I don't know if people realize that, you know, the Kennedy family, of course, was a huge family, Catholic family, but their oldest daughter, Rosemary, um, had an intellectual disability, a mild intellectual disability. I actually just finished reading a book about her. There she is. Um, not, not particularly a noticeable disability, like I said, um, mild. So, um, and they, they brought her up with the other kids. They, she went through all the etiquette training and all of that, the upper crust society did, you know, she had a coming out party, whatever, those kinds of things they did with debutantes. Um, but, uh, but, you know, if you spent time with her, talking with her, you would see some of the differences. But she presented just like every other young lady her age. Um, but over time, she started falling behind and realized it, knew she was falling behind, her, her brothers and her sisters, and not having the same experiences that they were. And, became, uh, would get agitated, would get upset, uh, depressed, all kinds of things. Well, they came out at that time when she was young with this fantastic new treatment that seemed to be helping a lot of people called a lobotomy. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with what that is, but that's basically separating the front part of the brain from the back part of the brain. And, um, and it was very experimental and what they were, you know, the doctors that were doing it were saying it was very successful, but what they were finding, and you know, a lot of people were not um, <laughs> experiencing success. They were experiencing all kinds of problems that were coming in down the road that followed them. And uh, Rosemary's, Rosemary Kennedy's father, Joe Kennedy, he had her lobotomized and it took away a lot of her physical movement, her speech, just a number of things. I mean, she really became much more uh, physically disabled after that time. At that point, they kept her, they really kept her secret. So that's why I think a lot of people don't ever realize that, that they had a, a sibling. 
but you may be familiar with like Special Olympics, the Kennedy family, um, Eunice Kennedy Shriver was active in getting Special Olympics started. Um, and all of that came about really because of Rosemary. Um, in 1964, the Hissa Memorial Center in Sand Springs was completed. Now, so at that time we had three state facilities. We had the Enid State School, the Falls Valley State School, and then the Hissom Memorial Center. And when Hissom was built, and you see that it was 1964 as opposed to, you know, 1907, like some of the others, like Enid and Falls Valley that we saw. So it was considered state of the art at the time. And those facilities each had um, well over, I don't know, I'm not sure how many, but well over 500 apiece individuals living there at least. Then um, on the national front, in 1971, the federal Medicaid program established standards of care for institutions. And those are what we know as the Title 19 standards that are still in existence today. Um, that, the, that, that the facilities, that the intermediate care facilities um, have to go by and have to follow and get surveyed by the health department. Then in 1975 is when Congress passed the Education for All Handicapped Children's Act. So when you think about it, that classroom you saw was 1957. That was actually started by probably some parents um, who wanted their kids to have something to do during the day. Because up until then, they weren't necessarily required to go to school. And the schools didn't have anything for them. I mean, they didn't know how to work with those kiddos. And it wasn't until 1975 that we got this law passed that requires a free and appropriate public education for every child with disabilities. Um, the school systems, I will say, still have a long way to go in being able to really effectively serve kids. I mean, they're not the only program that, that has difficulty, but um, because how you define appropriate education can vary. Um, it's required to be free and what what happens sometimes with families depending on where they live like if they live in rural oklahoma and they need services their little rural school may not have anything to serve their child and so their solution might be for that child to go to a larger school system which could be an hour away which is not the best solution either um, the schools are supposed to be funded um, based on the number of kids that they have who have disabilities and get some funding to help to support those kids. Um, and then again, what's an appropriate education? Um, kids with disabilities sometimes have, they have a lot more issues, maybe regulating their behavior and uh, their emotions. And so if they become aggressive or, or have some kind of issues in, in class, um, then the school sometimes recommends that they um, do homeschooling. Um, and homeschooling does not have to be five or six hours a day, five days a week. Sometimes it's a couple of days a week and a teacher might come for a couple of hours. Is that an appropriate education? I don't know. That's so, so that wording is sometimes, sometimes abused and sometimes difficult to, to define what an appropriate education is for a particular child. Um, Then we have the Oklahoma Department of Public Welfare, which is what I work for, which is now the Oklahoma Department of Human Services, um, began to develop um, some services outside of the institution. The first things they developed were sheltered workshops. And if you're not familiar with that model, the sheltered workshop is a place, a room, a building where individuals could come and work on contract work. It might be an example, and, and they still exist today, um, where they might, let's say, package silverware for a restaurant, um, where you put a knife, fork, and spoon in a, in a little, you know, plastic, those little paper bags that you sometimes get, something like that. Um, and then individuals are paid for, for the um, work that they do. But the thing about sheltered workshops is that they can get a license from the Department of Labor, they can get a sub-minimum wage 
license or approval, which means that they're allowed to pay less than minimum wage to individuals with disabilities based on that individual's um, work ability. And so that would mean, let's say, so what they do is, let's say they're packaging silverware. They would get, um, what they do is they get three individuals who you would consider typical, normal, typical, um, and they would have those people practice packaging silverware, and then they would time them for an hour. How many packages of silverware can they complete in an hour? And let's say they can complete 100 packages of silverware in an hour. Well, if, if the prevailing wage, the community wage for that kind of work, let's say it's $10, because I'm going to keep my math easy. It's late in the afternoon. Um, but let's say somebody working at the restaurant can make $10 an hour doing it. And the, and the, the average person can do 100 packages in an hour. Then, so that's how you figure what your wage is for the typical person. Then when you have the, the individual with disabilities doing it, um, what does that, I said it was easy math, it's really not, because I'm like, how much does that come out to? They would figure out the rate per silverware package. So that would be, help me out here, <laughs> 100 packages of silverware in 10 hours, 10, I don't know, whatever that is. I can't figure it out. Obviously, it's late in the day. Yeah. Let's say it's an app. Let's say it's a dollar a package. That's too much, but would it be 10 cents maybe? I think 10 cents a, a package. So you make 10 cents for every one that you package. So if the individual can do 50 in an hour, that individual could get paid $5 an hour um, under the minimum wage, under the amount that other people make for that. But it's because of their disability that they, um, are being paid less. They're being paid on what their ability is to do. So if they can only package, let's say five in an hour, because they have a physical disability that makes it difficult to use their hands or whatever, um, you know, they're gonna make 50 cents for that hour's worth of work. Um, so, you know, it was putting people to work, which was good rather than just being at home, but is it, you know, when you think about, I don't know, is that a good wage? Um, is that fair to the person? I'm, I'm not going to say, um, but I do know that there are a lot of uh, different kinds of adaptations you can make out there. For example, if the person can't hold the bag open to put the silverware in, then why not create a something that will hold all the bags so they're not having to hold the bag. Then they're just putting the silverware in that might double their production. So, that, you know, there's a lot of ways to help people be more productive and make a higher wage. And there's a lot of movement away from the sub minimum wage because of, again, you, you can see where some of the issues are. And if the people who are figuring out the wage haven't figured it out right, because um, there's a specific way to do it, basically, like I told you, then you could be underpaying people and then violating Department of Labor rules if you haven't figured it out correctly. And if you don't give people those, those adaptations to make it easier for them, if they can't grasp very well, number one, is that even a good job for them? Um, but how can you help them grasp better? How can you help them speed up their work so they make more? Then in 1981, we had the first group homes developed by First Lady Donna Nye. If you, if any, again, I don't know how old people are, um, if you even remember Governor Nye, but his wife was very, very interested in, in helping people with intellectual disabilities. And the group homes, when they were developed, had between usually six to 12 people living together um, with one or two staff supporting them. And it allowed, so it allowed adults who might have been living at home and who didn't want to live at home to move out, or especially adults whose families just couldn't um, support them anymore for whatever reason. Maybe the parents were getting elderly, or the person just needed more assistance than they could provide. They had to work. They, they couldn't be there assisting the individual. And the first group homes proved to be so successful. 
that within a few years, um, there were more than 60 group homes across the state. And some of them, um, I mean, and we still have group homes today. So, and if you, I don't know if anybody works for uh, any of the intermediate care facilities, you may be familiar with some of the group homes because even, even some of the intermediate care facilities for folks without disabilities may have, they may have a part of their program. Then in 1981, we had some families whose children were at the Hissa Memorial Center and they were not pleased with the services that were happening. Services had kind of gone downhill. Um, so the facility that was being considered state of the art was not doing such a great job. Um, and so these families joined together and started a lawsuit, which was called the Homeward Bound Lawsuit. <laughs> Medicaid funding was threatened to be cut off because of the Title 19 standards again and the health department coming in and surveying and if they find enough things out of compliance that are health safety violations, um, they can't cut off funding, funding until those things are fixed or permanent. So we had that lawsuit starting in Oklahoma. But then at about the same time, on a national level, um, Medicaid was starting the community programs. And at the time, again, when mostly what we had, the, the uh, group homes were state funded. They weren't, didn't get any federal money. Um, the the uh, three state schools, the Falls Valley, Enid, and Hissam that I talked about, they got some federal funding um, um, to support them. But at, the, at this point, at the same time the Hissam Memorial lawsuit came out, the feds were, were trying to expand community services and they allowed for the funding that was going to the facilities, to the institutions, to be waived um, and funneled into community programs. So an individual, the way they defined it, was an individual who was at risk of going into an institution um, because of the level of care that they needed, et cetera, um, if they were at risk of that, that money could be diverted to support them in the community. And so our, our community waiver program was approved and started in 1985. And um, to give some history on myself, in 1983, I was working at the Falls Valley State School. And when the community program started in 1985, I also, I moved, transferred, or took the job at our community program as, as the area psychologist. In the areas, um, my office, we covered the southern 35 counties of Oklahoma. And at the time, and as I said earlier, at the time there were about 1,500 people in our three public facilities. And at that time also, there were several private facilities, which are the ones you might be familiar with. Um, some of them still, McCall's Chapel, um, I think it's some of the names, Meadowbrook, anyway. But uh, we, there were also private facilities. They were smaller. I think the, the largest of the private facilities has always been maybe 100, not ever 500. Then in 1985, a few years after those parents started the lawsuit, um, a, a class, the class action lawsuit was actually filed. That pulled in anybody who had ever lived at Hissom, was living there at the time, or had ever lived at Hissom. Um, and then in 1987, the judge in the case ruled that Hissom could be closed, that it must be closed, and that all of the residents at that time, 420, must be moved out into community settings with services and supports to meet their needs. And I can tell you, since I had gone to work in the area office, that that, that ballooned our community services, where before it was just growing little bit by little bit. We're gonna talk about those community services in a minute, but um, when this lawsuit happened and those, those 420 people had to be moved out, 
plus everybody who had ever lived at Hissom had to be offered, had to be evaluated to determine if they needed additional services and supports. Um, we got a lot of money funneled into our community program at that time. Then in 1992, the state schools changed their names to the um, Oklahoma Resource Center in Enid and the Oklahoma Resource Center in Paul's Valley. And the reason for the name change was in one, school implies children. And we really weren't admitting children anymore at that time. And um, plus it, it, you know, again, it, like I said, it, it makes you think of children and most of the people living there were adults. Plus, we wanted to make the uh, resource centers more of a resource, even for the communities. If someone had a broken wheelchair or needed to ask questions of a physical therapist or any number of things, we wanted those facilities to become true resources where we could. Then in 1994, the last resident moved out of Hissom and the institution was declared closed ahead of, ahead of schedule. Took a lot, a lot of work, let me tell you. And some of the individuals who moved out were, you know, had, a, had high medical needs, uh, may have had high behavior support needs, um, but a lot of, so a lot of services had to be put in place. That we had a, um, what they called a review panel that um, watched to see how things were going once people moved into the community, make sure they were still safe, make sure they were still getting the services and supports that they needed. Um, then in 1998, the state, us, petitioned to end the court supervision. And it happened in 2005, 20 years after the lawsuit was filed. So this was one of the longest lawsuits of its type um, in history. Then, do you know I, about do you know about how many uh, his and class members are still alive? I know their their population is dwindling. That's, that's a really good question. I don't know. I was actually thinking about that myself a little while back. It's I want to say I want to say, and they called this the focus class if they were at Hissom at the time versus the balance of class, which were people who were not at Hissom at the time. I think of the focus class. I want to say there's two hundred and something still still living some some died wow. you know, some died kind of age-related mm. stuff some again who were medically involved died because of medical complications but um, we've still got a pretty good sized population and i'm going to talk about them a little bit more in a little bit um, when i talk more about the community services good question thank you that's making me think i want to go get the actual answer now um, in 1992, while all of this was going on, an additional facility was built in Enid on the grounds of the resource center there um, called the Robert and Greer Center, 52 bed facility, and it is an ICF IID, and its target audience are individuals who are dually diagnosed, meaning have a, have a diagnosis of intellectual disability and a diagnosis of um, having mental health issues of some kind. So it's really, it's a treatment facility is really what it is. And then, so moving forward in 2012, the state opted to close both the resource center in Enid and the resource center in Paul's Valley. And in 2014, the resource center in Enid closed. And as you can see, there, there are, other buildings you can see in the background, but the but the building for the uh, Institute for the Feeble Minded, the one that was originally built, is still there. It's been it was renovated and it actually became the main offices, but that building is still there on the campus. Um, most of the campus is still empty. The city looked at buying it, but they haven't. But at the time it closed, there were about 150 people living there, down from 500. Um, we had over time moved people out um, who were interested in receiving services in the community. 
then in 2015, we closed the Paul's Valley facility. And they also had around 150, 128 to 150, somewhere in there, individuals living there at the time. And of course, we had learned a lot from moving people out of Kissam. So we kind of followed the same model in assisting people to move out and into their own homes from these facilities. So today, more than 10,000 people with intellectual disabilities receive services in their own homes and in communities across the state. And those are numbers based on, on the programs that we provide. I mean, of course, there are many other Oklahomans with intellectual disabilities who live in their own homes and who aren't receiving services from us, they, but they may be children going to school or they could be um, adults attending a vocational program and paying for it themselves or something. Um, <clears throat> we've had new federal regulations coming down the pipe that um, require all residential settings to be, and it's called, we call it the settings rule. Um, so, so residential services have to be in the community, just like they are for everybody else. And the individuals who live in those residential supports must be able to access all the services that everybody accesses. That means the same doctors, same grocery stores, the same recreational activities, all of that. Um, because some of the group homes and things when they were originally built, they were built maybe outside, kind of outside of town, on the edge of town. Or you might have, let's say, an agency um, built three group homes. They put them all together. Well, you know, especially if they had six to 12 people living in them, that's not going to look like a home on a residential street. And when you've got three buildings that big together, that's going to look like, again, more like a facility or an institution than a group home or a res just a residence that somebody might live in. Um, so the feds are trying to push things along to become even more more community-based. Now, the, and there, as you see, if you see at the bottom of your uh, the PowerPoint note, there continue to be over 100 smaller private ICFs, IIDs across the state. That do says range in size from four to 160. And I think most of them now are maybe under 100, but I'm not sure. Um, but most of, most of even those small facilities are only serving about 12 to 18 people. The ones that are serving a large population are very few and far between. You know, what we've discovered from, and this is nothing about the staff who work in those facilities, but the problem you have with that large congregate type of facility, um, the, I would say the pluses are, that you can have a doctor, nurses, therapist, maybe on staff, just right readily available. Um, then on the negative side, though, is people aren't living in their own communities. They're not doing all the just the same things that everybody else does. Because um, your family may be able to just say, hey, let's have a pizza night, you know, and jump in the car and go to Pizza Hut and have a pizza. Um, but 12 people in a group home kind of situation or a hundred people in an ICF um, to take, you know, you can take a few of them at a time, um, but it's hard to really be part of your community um, when you live in a facility, especially when it's on the outskirts of town, when it doesn't look like a home, when it looks different than everybody else's home. Then it's like, ooh, you know, that's when, ooh, what is that place? Oh, that's a strange looking place. What is that? Um, so it can be stigmatizing for the people as well. So like I said, and I worked at the Falls Valley State School. Great, there were some great staff there who did some great things, um, but there was always that inability to really integrate into the community because it's, it's just extremely difficult with a large group of people to integrate them. So we talked about, I talked about the waiver programs and how the money got waived and transferred over to community services for individuals and our and the community services program started in 1985 and that's kind of what I'm going to talk about now we'll take a break in a few minutes we'll let everybody have a break but uh there's the mission of, of my division developmental disability services 
help individuals with disabilities and their families to lead safer, healthier, and more independent lives. That, I mean, that's kind of the basic thing I think we all want to do. How are our community services funded? We have, there are three methods of funding, the waiver funds, which are federal funds. Then there's state money, um, because to, to pull down those federal monies, we have to put in state dollars. And there's a, there's a formula for that. There's a whole matching thing. So let's say, for example, that we get a, um, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna get them and try to make my math easy. Um, let's say we get a 30% match Basically, that means that for every dollar spent, if we if we put in 30 cents state money, we get 80 cents, I mean 70, see, I can't even do that now. We get 70 cents from the feds. So for every dollar we spend on an individual, we're, the state is paying 30 cents and the federal government is paying 70 cents for that person's support. So that's a good thing, you know, because um, our state doesn't have the money to fund everybody in the services that they need. So we want to pull down as many federal dollars as we can. We do have a few programs that are completely state funded, but they're small programs. Um, then we have a few people that, that are private pay um, as well. <laughs> I, I've got some current numbers at the current time. The community services program is, like I said, really large. We serve over 10,000 people across the state. There's a lot of people waiting for services. Um, a lot of young people and children will get, get on our wait list so that at some point as they grow up and may need additional supports, um, they may be approved for our community services programs. And at the current time, basically, we have 5,800 people across the state waiting for services. Um, we're trying to work our way through because sometimes when we start working through that wait list, we find some people have passed away, some people have moved out of state, some people no longer need additional supports, um, but some do. Um, but of course, as we start working the wait list, we're getting additional applications for services on top of that. So. The wait list is always kind of a, a shifting thing. Now to be, of course, to be eligible for our services, you basically have to have a diagnosis of intellectual disability um, or disability occurring during the developmental period um, with accompanying deficits in, um, in a two or more life areas, you know, like your ability to take care of yourself, things like that. So we do follow the federal definition of intellectual and developmental disability. And we have, these are some of our community services programs. Um, waiver, I'm not gonna talk about all of these, but waiver services, the family assistance program, which is state funded. Um, we still have group homes. We still have sheltered workshops or center-based programs. And then we have community integrated employment, which is people work, which is people working out in regular jobs in the community. They may work at Pizza Hut. They may work in an office setting. And then assisted living is another program. Now our waivers and we have, um, Oklahoma has, you have to apply to, to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, the feds. Um, and get approved to have a waiver program. And we have, Oklahoma actually has four waivers. We just, what we call them our waivers. That's the application. Um, we have one waiver that we call our um, home and community-based waiver. And that's, that's our biggest one, biggest program. And it has a whole array of services that go along with it. And it can offer residential services and employment services. It can offer therapies. Um, it can offer um, staff, staffing. We call them HTSs, habilitation training specialists. You would think of them as, as your direct care staff or whatever name you might use. Um, kind of like kind of like nurse aides, basically. Um, and they can work wherever that person lives, in the in the family home or in a residential setting. Um, 
We don't work in the schools because the schools are required to provide whatever the child needs. We develop a, uh, and this is true even in the facilities, we, we create a plan of care, we create an individual plan for that, for each individual that reflects what their needs are and, and what kind of supports that they need. We use a person-centered planning approach. And um, one thing you, I meant to mention this in the beginning, but you may notice that um, you will notice me not use the term mental retardation because um, that's that's out the door. I use intellectual or developmental disability, and that's also out of respect for individuals with disabilities who have their own self-advocacy networks and say, we don't like that term. And, and I'm sure you have said it, and I have in the past too. I mean, what do you say when, some, when one of your friends does something stupid? You say, what are you, retarded? You know, um, it's kind of like the N word. They call it the R word. Um, it's not a, you know, it's not a positive thing to be considered retarded. You know, what else do we say? Oh, he rides the short bus. You know, we don't even think about those terms. Um, Something back in the day used to say big head. Do what? Used to say big head. Big head. Yeah, and and things like oh, um, those over there, they're the tube feeders. You know, if they if they're fed through a tube, he's a runner. Uh, whatever. You know, people are identified by their issues and things. Um, that's so dehumanizing. You know, when I went to work at Falls Valley State School, I was a um, one of the psychological. Um, associates out there. I did testing, you know, on individuals, IQ testing and stuff. And they still, they had IQ tests in their files that said, um, you know, that tested Johnny and said that Johnny functions in the um, imbecile range of functioning. Those were the actual categories that were used for, for individuals with disabilities. You, might, you were at the moron level, the imbecile level, the idiot level. Those, and so when you think of, and you know, nobody knows that we call each other, what we call each other idiots and imbeciles all the time, you know? Yeah, we don't know, even know where those terms came from, but they came from memory retardation. They came from intellectual disability. They were the categories used. Um, so if nothing else, keep those things in mind and, and be more conscious of the terms that we use when we refer to people. Um, especially if you fall into other categories that that often get bad labels, um, you know, people of a different race, people of uh, even females versus males, um, people of different sexual orientations, et cetera. Um, it's the same for folks with disabilities and the terminology. And we don't even we don't even realize it when we say, "Don't be an idiot," you know. <laughs> but that's where that term came from. But we use a person-centered planning approach when we are working with individuals and when we're writing an, in, an annual plan for people and that plan of treatment um, where we explore with the individual. What, what do you want your life to look like? What do you want it to be? And if they're not able to communicate, then we, we talk to the uh, parents or family members or somebody else close to the individual. I think somebody's not muted. My check because there's some talking going on in the background. Um, but, uh, so, you know, how does that person want their life to look? How do they want to live it? And then that's what we try to help them attain. We don't want to give people services and supports that, that they're not interested in. You know, I could look at any of you. I could look at, at my uh, friend here, the only, the only other human being in the room. Um, and if I got to know him, I might have all kinds of suggestions for him. He might have suggestions sure. for me. You know, you can stand to lose some weight, lady, or, you know, whatever. Um, but that doesn't mean that's what I want from you. Um, so what is it that people want to, to make their life really have value and meaning? And that's the approach we try to take. And we assess, we try to assess people's strengths and build on their strengths. You know, if, if someone is a, uh, um, oh, we've had some individuals who would have been labeled uh, 
the behavioral issues, you know. Oh my gosh, he don't, Johnny can't go in the bathroom and be by himself for very long because he'll disassemble the toilet, you know, and take it apart. Well, you know, that could be seen as certainly as a problem, as a challenge. It could also be seen as a strength. Um, that's telling you some skills the man has. He got some, he got some skills. So let's find him a job. He can put those skills to work um, and use it for good instead of evil. Um, you know, those kinds of things. So we, we try to evaluate people's strengths and based on those strengths, um, how can we expand on those? You still got any? Be sure to mute yourself. We can hear you. Hello? Lights up, whoever's talking. Unmute yourself now, though. Go back to this one. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I think that was the Mayberry. I don't want the start of the Mayberry song. So somebody's got Mayberry on on the TV. I'm thinking. I'm thinking maybe you're not listening to me then. Um, but uh, in our community services program, we have case managers who kind of take the lead. Um, we have core teams made up of the individual, their guardian, if they have one or an advocate if they have one, and the case manager who kind of make these decisions about what kinds of supports they need or want. Now we have the community waiver, which I just talked about. We also have two in-home supports waivers. These are smaller waivers. The community waiver doesn't have a money cap on it. I mean, if somebody's very medically needy and what they need for the year is $100,000 worth of services, then that may be what they get. And again, from that, we draw down, let's say 70% of that is federal money. And so we pay out $30,000 in state dollars to draw down $70,000 for that person's program. And our in-home supports waivers, we have one for children and one for adults. And that is a capitated um, program. Yeah, there's the rates um, for the, for the in-home supports waiver. Children get roughly 15,000, um, adults get 23,000. The reason children don't get as much is because there are other programs out there that can also support kids. The schools, again, are required to support kids for what they need in school. Um, there's also another program called Early and Periodic Testing and Screening, EPSDT, that provides can provide certain therapies. And so we don't provide as much to kids because they should be accessing those services first. But it is a capitated, these are capitated waiver programs and they're for individuals who live, continue to live in their own or their family's home. Um, so they don't need you typically as, as much service as somebody who moves out of the family home and gets residential services, et cetera. Uh, Um, so we also have a program called the Family Support Assistance Program, and this is just a monetary monthly payment to families who have children um, with disabilities. And it's, I don't remember what the amount is, but it, it depends on how many kids they may have with disabilities. It's something like $300, $400 a month, and I don't know if I, yeah, 250 to 400 I don't know what the exact number is now, but it's just a payment. They're not getting our waiver services. They get no other supports from us. If they accept the money payment, that's what they get. And they can spend it on briefs if they need them. They can spend it on, save it up for a wheelchair. They can use it for therapies. They can use it to buy formula, whatever they might need. Um, it's up to them then how they spend it. And this is a state dollar program. 
and the legislature every year um, funds a certain amount that, that we can use here. We still do have group homes and some of them are state group homes and, and state dollars paying for those. Um, but we do have some group homes that we have converted to use the waiver funds to draw down federal money as well. And our group homes now serve at most 12 individuals. I think most of them serve between four and six individuals together. Um, and these are folks who don't need high levels of support. So they can get by a lot of times with one staff working in the home and helping them. They're able to do quite a bit for themselves. They're adults, but we do work with um, child welfare. We have some group homes that we help to support. They're actually child welfare's group homes, but we put additional supports into those homes. So some of their kids, they serve a good number of kids that have disabilities. Um, as well. We talked about sheltered workshops earlier, so I won't go back through that a lot. Let, how about let's take a break and let's come back at 3.30, if that works for everybody, give you a chance to stand up and move air. How much longer you got left? 